evening. My name is Ian Allen, I'm the Executive Director of the College of Extended Learning. Um, and really this is uh, more of a story of how we've brought mental wellness and wellness as a whole into our organization, our unit at UNB. Um, so basically, um, you know, it, it is one of these things where I, I won't keep you that long today. Um, it's a beautiful day, um, at least here in Fredericton, and hopefully we'll have many more in the coming weeks. Um, I, nice days, I mean, not, not seminars. Um, so I would like to provide you with our story, um, you know, how we've been able to incorporate several strategies uh, into our workplace uh, to increase our level of workplace wellness. Um, over the, the past number of days and weeks, uh, as we return from 18 plus months of, of working remotely and getting used to being back together again physically, um, I think it's become increasingly important to ensure a, a safe workplace for everyone. Um, if you're able to gain some insight and maybe some ideas to help you improve wellness in your workplace, well, that's, that's a bonus for sure. Um, so just really quickly, um, I'll provide you with a bit of an overview of who we are and what, what we do. This is um, sort of the ongoing saga of CEL at UNB, um, trying to prove to the outside world what we do, but also to, to our colleagues within, inside the institution as to what we do and the importance of what we do. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a, an overview of our structure, um, talk about wellness in our workplace and what we're doing, have been doing and what we'll continue to do, um, and, and then we'll take some questions at the end. So where are we? Um, we're located in the Wu Conference Center, uh, Marshall Davery and Memorial Hall at UNB. Um, our, our staff is kind of spread all over the place because we do look after a number of different areas. Um, and I'll, I'll go through those in a minute. Um, for, for lack of a better term, and I'm not going to, to read all of this, but we are the outreach arm of UNB. Um, we'd like to say that we kind of look after pretty much everything that no one else either wants to do or can do. And during the summer months, we take care of, of probably 90% of everything that happens at UNB, kind of becoming mini financial services, the mini registrar's office. So um, pretty much the only thing we don't look after in the summer are the athletics camps and, and sport camps for children. Um, and as the slide indicates, we are one of the most diverse and probably robust uh, continuing edu education units in the country. Um, we have at this time around 55 to 60 staff. So we have five program units. Um, you can see that we're a diverse group. We offer a wide variety of, of programming for all ages. And I, and I truly mean that um, from summer kids camps, um, design work, uh, workshops, um, all the way up through to, to senior uh, learners and, and adults. Um, we look after credit programming and learner support on behalf of faculties, um, including our BIS program. Um, we look after the Center for Musical Arts and all of the music programs, uh, both independently and in collaboration with the Faculty of Arts. Um, we also um, have the UNB Art Center, which includes the art galleries and personal and cultural enrichment programs um, that have uh, certainly increased in popularity over, over the last number of years um, and were per particularly, uh, I think, important um, and you know, timely during the pandemic as people were not able to get out and we were delivering everything um, in a remote fashion um, online. Um, the English language program is also part of what we do um, and also career and professional development. Those are in no, no kind of order, but it is just meant for you to see sort of the diversity of what we're doing. So we also have four administrative units that, that help support all of the other five units, and that includes finance and operation, business development and sales, marketing and communications, and contract development and market research. So those are the areas that really help support all of the initiatives that we do, both on the degree credit and non-credit side of things. So I'll, I'd like to go back a few years and, and sort, sort of, you know, provide you with the impetus of, of where we um, were and, and how we got to where we are today. Um, we've been involved in the world of occupational health and safety for over 20 years, um, have one of the most successful programs in the country, um, and, and that's kind of a proven fact, we know that. 
We've had over 13,000 individuals go through our certificate and diploma programs. And, you know, sort of an indication of the success of those programs and sort of the, 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 the breadth and depth of our audience is that 60% of the people that have enrolled and taken those programs over the years have been Ontario West. Um, we're very well known in you know, the, the Prairie provinces and, and beyond um, for the level of quality with our programs. So several years ago, we started seeing a, a bit of a shift in this area um, where primarily before physical um, or, or you know, occupational health and safety was really around the physical side of things. And increase, increasingly, we, we were receiving inquiries from those individuals and, and corporations um, that were looking for more solutions um, in the area of mental wellness and met, uh, mental well being, um, you know, and, and how that applied to safety in the workplace. So it really was moving from that, you know, health and safety meaning more than just wearing a hard hat. It was, more around what was happening, be, you know, between your ears as well for, you know, uh, for lack of a better term. So, you know, we, we looked at how are we going to conduct our mental, uh, mental wellness research, our market research to find out what worked best, um, what people were looking for, because at that particular moment in time, and this is going back six, seven, eight years, um, we didn't really know what we didn't know. Um, but looking at you know the mental health commission and their reports they indicate that approximately 30 percent of short and long-term disability claims can be attributed to mental health problems and illnesses um, so this translates to an overall economic economic burden in the range of 50 billion dollars a year and that's billion with a b um, and of that a staggering 20 billion dollars stems from workplace losses including productivity and staff turnover so not only just people not showing up for work, but being there and not being present. And this is an issue that's not going to go away anytime soon, given what we've gone through over the last 18 months. I think if nothing else, it's brought it to the forefront um, in a much more highlighted way. So, you know, basically um, our idea was is to create programming that not only fit with the world of occupational health and safety, but also could stand on its own. So in, in order to move ahead in this space, because one of the things we've realized over the years that we can't be all things to all people with respect to our knowledge base. Um, so we, we thought about who we could partner with. And in this space, we, we've been so fortunate to partner with a number of amazing experts and practitioners, uh, including Dr. William Howitt, uh, president of Howitt HR, and who has done extensive work with the Conference Board of Canada and was the chief productivity uh, officer for Morneau Chappelle for a number of years. And also Dr. Bill Morrison or William Morrison of WMA Wellness, um, also one of the other speakers at this conference. Um, I'd strongly encourage you to participate in that one as well, because I'll touch lightly on some of what um, Bill has done with us and for us. Um, but it is also one of those things where understanding, you know, what's sort of behind their methodology is, is quite outstanding. Um, and I always like to say that we'd like to work with bills. Um, and we've also worked extensively with a number of professionals from the world of health and safety. Uh, many of these folks that, you know, we've worked with for, for years in areas um, like fatigue management and um, occupational and industrial hygiene and, and, and whatnot, because a lot of what they do um, has much overlap with the world of, of mental wellness. This is just to give you a sense of, of the, some of the types of programs and courses that we've developed. Um, this by no means is a selling moment. Um, we'll certainly be continuing our work in this area and build on what we've already done. Um, and if the pandemic is any indication of future workplaces, we'll all need to be responsive um, to what our, what our workplace needs and what our staff needs. Um, so Pathway to Coping, Certificate in Psychological Safe Leadership, which is becoming really popular, um, and courses around disability management, fatigue management, and then mental wellness practices, supporting mental health at risk. So being able to understand uh, some of the warning signs, um, 
both as employees, but also as managers of others. So I'm a strong believer in that the, the level of health and wellness within your own organization um, will directly impact the wellness of, of individual employees. Um, for a number of years, you know, we've taken pride in staff involvement in extracurricular activities, so to speak, and, you know, ways to connect with the outside world, um, but include that in, in, as part of their daily lives. I'll talk a, a, a bit more, more about that um, a little bit later on, because I think it is important to, you know, to recognize what we as a unit and what my staff have been doing, but also um, how it sort of really, I think, plays well um, into, you know, our, our workplace culture. So we, you know, we first started developing courses uh, and programs in this area. Um, and I, I guess because when you don't have a huge staff that is, is able to kind of look after quality assurance, although we, we have increased in that area as well, um, we asked a number of our staff to help us with reviewing the content um, starting with Pathway to Coping and, and in partnership with Dr. Bill Howitt. As a result of that, um, many folks indicated that just reviewing the courses and the materials was helping them deal with some, some level of stress or, and every, everyday pressures in their own lives. Um, you know, primarily due to the fact that the courses are self-guided, include reflective activities, um, and there's no quizzes or exams because that's not what they're designed for. And really people have almost unfettered access for an extended period of time. So as they get through these courses, they're actually able to go back and, and continue doing them um, through journaling exercises and, and, and more. So once we had the courses completed and we're now on, our, I think our third or fourth iteration, um, as we continue to try to improve them, we decided to provide access to all of our staff, um, not out of any sense at that time of real uh, moral obligation, but we were looking for feedback um, on the structure. Um, we wanted to help better understand what individuals were looking for in these type of short courses. Um, and, you know, we thought our staff if we could provide them with an extra tool that would help them, then all the better as well. And it turned out that you can't simply just start over again and, and continue the journey, but through these type of courses, um, I, that journaling aspect of, of how they're laid out and how they're set up um, goes beyond just sort of awareness and, and becomes an exercise, you know, with involvement. Um, and, a, and a lot of people were really enjoying them. Now, when you're offering up courses in, you know, that deal with different ways to, to you know, to cope and, and, to, and deal with stress, it's not like we're going to be checking in with people to find out how they're enjoying them. Um, it's, it's a personal journey. We know a lot of people probably didn't, you know, sort of engage with the course, um, but those that did, and in fact, a number of them did come forward and, and indicate how much it had helped them. So. So when we, you know, began to realize that, that this was maybe a new way that we could help staff um, and not be looking at just an external market and, and, and as a way to generate revenue, because if I didn't mention it before, the, uh, the College of Extended Learn, Learning is a revenue generating unit. So we do have um, expectations, um, but if we're able to do things like this for our staff, all the better. So, you know, simply offering courses in, in without any kind of a strategy, um, you know, we thought, okay, how can we kind of pull this all together, um, create a strategy of how we can help people when it comes to helping improve morale and the well-being of our team. And we were at that point in early conversations with Dr. Morrison, Dr. Bill Morrison of WMA Wellness. Um, where their focus is on mental fitness and resiliency through their tool called Mental Fitness and Resiliency Inventory, or MFRI. Um, we really liked what we were seeing as, as far as being able to partner with them and offer this to the outside world. But again, you know, from a, a selfish perspective, we thought, how can this help our staff? Um, so, you know, we, we had several conversations with Bill 
I'll call them that now because we're we're beyond the you know sort of the official titles um, and trying to get across to him how we wanted to be able to bring this to our staff and help them um, better understand it. And it's always one of those things where you know when you're when you're in the world of we, where we are in looking at continuing professional education, um, upskilling and reskilling, it really is good if you can you know, have a really solid understanding of, of what you're putting out there in the world, um, be confident in it, um, that the quality is as, as best as you can make it, but having people better understand it from an, an inside perspective, i.e. your staff, all the better. Um, and that's where I think the connection gets made between what we're doing out there and what we're doing in here. In other words, we are sort of walking the walk. I won't provide a whole lot of information on the tool itself, see Bill's presentation tomorrow. Um, and, you know, he can certainly explain it a whole lot better than I can, because it's not an area of my expertise. But in short, you know, your staff completes uh, an initial survey composed of eight different measures, including things like relatedness, autonomy, support, relationship assets, um, and, and several others. And basically, it's a tool that helps create awareness of where your strengths are as an organization or a unit, and then what are some of the things that maybe you need to work on. Um, and then basically, you know, it, it gives you an overall score as, as a unit. Um, we, you know, we're more than open to all of the suggestions provided as to how to raise your score um, in those areas where we were falling a little bit short. And sometimes it was just through awareness um, as opposed to doing anything that was, you know, sort of tangible. Um, one of the secrets that we quickly learned is, and we were able to arrange in, uh, to have a, several of our staff members actually trained in the tool um, and then help lead us uh, with activities um, over time. Now I am talking pre-COVID, so, um, you know, we, we were doing these things in a face-to-face -face environment, um, you know, the group work and the group activities. Um, and, you know, then you sort of reach a point where you want to ask people to do the survey once again. And we did. And a second survey, you know, several months later showed that we had improved in all areas. Um, and, and staff really experienced a, a sense of pride in that, in the results. But, it also gave them a better understanding of how their contributions and involvement led to the outcomes. Um, the experience has provided us with ways to continue our efforts through, you know, regular activities. Uh, and, and even during the pandemic, um, we were meeting, you know, every two weeks as a large group where normally during, I don't, uh, normal times or pre-pandemic, we would meet once a month um, something called coffee talk, where we would all get together to socialize a little bit and and to um, get updated on on sort of what was happening with all the respective units. Given that again, we're all not all in the same building, so we don't get a chance to see each other all the time. Um, but we moved to incorporate uh, more personal as aspects of how we were doing these uh, events, and as opposed to, you know, just in the beginning um, when we were all working remotely and doing these things through Zoom at the time and then Teams, um, we, we did move to smaller group conversations um, that I think really helped staff connect with individuals that they normally wouldn't have had an opportunity to. Um, and, and it worked really well. Um, so we were, you know, trying to do everything possible during the pandemic, but building on a lot of the aspects of what we had done prior to. So I, I mentioned that, um, you know, the, the team building exercises really improved our, our collective sense of cohesiveness um, as a unit or, or a department at, at UNB. Um, it's certainly not a standalone one-time event. Uh, it takes a great deal of work and the involvement of many individuals to truly create and, and maintain a positive and resilient workplace. Um, you know, we have a wellness committee that's been in place for a number of years, um, has membership from all of our various units, um, including those that have been, you know, trained in the MFRI process. So a lot of what we do is, is you know, sort of guided by that, that tool itself. But of course, it, it's not, we don't strongly, you know, 
adhere to it at all times. We, we still want to be able to have fun with other things that necessarily, you know, um, help help build cohesiveness within a unit as well. And again, um, they, they help organize our biweekly coffee talks. Um, they bring in guest speakers from other areas at UNB, you know, including human resources or health and safety, because during the pandemic, especially, um, the updates were coming, if, if not daily, almost hourly. Um, and, you know, we also bring in people from the general public to talk about things like healthy lifestyles and, and, and eating habits, um, you know, ergonomic uh, uh, suggestions for, you know, when we're working at the kitchen table or the dining room table or on the sofa, um, how you can help yourself sort of, you know, maintain a level of, of um, not needing to run to the hospital with carpal tunnel because, um, because you're working on at the sofa. Um, and then an occasional round of yoga or fitness activities. But as a group, um, you know, I work with probably one of the most dedicated, uh, you know, the group of folks that I know. Um, our workplace wouldn't be the same without this wellness committee. And I say that because, you know, there's eight or 10 of them. They take the lead on a lot of what we do. Um, and they've been especially valuable during the pandemic as a way to engage with staff as to what's going on. Um, both at UNB, but the larger community. Um, and it's also a, a way for, you know, for staff to ask questions about how to, you know, return to work issues, which a lot of areas, a lot of organizations are dealing with right now. And we continue to deal with them. As, and as I said, um, information changes so quickly that we want to make sure that everyone's getting, well, the latest, I, I was going to say the latest and greatest, but sometimes it's not. Um, but it is a way to, to sort of keep people safe um, but it's also a way to socialize with people um, that I haven't been able to see for some, quite some time. We're, it's it's kind of nice as, as the level of anxiety and pressure sort of diminishes over this last week and a half or so as we've kind of come back in a staged approach. Um, I think people are realizing the value in, in just that five minute chat with somebody that they haven't seen other than on a, on a computer screen for the last while. Um, and I, and I think, you know, as we move back on campus, a lot of these activities will, uh, will resume. Um, but I also think that we'll be looking at how are, um, are there other ways that we can, you know, maintain this level of cohesiveness and, and ensure that everybody's safe, you know, from a mental wellness perspective. So, you know, some of the, some of the activities um, that we do, um, there's all kinds of social events. Um, you know, we have a summer fest get together every year. Um, we unfortunately couldn't do it this year, um, where it's off, off site and we take a half a day and just have fun. Um, we have a Christmas party, which is, um, always a themed event. Um, I don't know how people come up with it. Um, this was Christmas 2018 and I'm, I'm trying to think if it was, um, uh, rad plaid or fad plaid or something anyway um, everyone participates and we and we have a great time but not only that these are events that are designed to bring our staff together and have some fun and and be able to socialize but if you look down the corner of this room um, these bags are not bag stuff with uh, paper um, that are decorations um, we've been able to, to create a number of causes and combine them with our, our social events. And, you know, this involved four truckloads of essentials that we delivered to the, um, to the men's shelter, um, several years ago. Um, and it, it, you know, basically just meant everybody working together. Um, we raise our own money to do these kind of things through 50, 50 draws and whatever else. Or people just use their personal contacts and, and contacts within the, the larger community to, to do these kind of things. There's, you know, there's a, a real sense of accomplishment, but also pride in being able to come together as a group because we are fortunate that way. Um, but also to be able to help other groups out, um, you know, as well. Um, and, and not just these events every year, um, you know. Um, we sponsor Christmas families um, that are associated with the university um, and th through the adult learner um, as associations that, you know, we're involved with as well. Um, 
my staff do mindful Mondays and thoughtful Thursdays, which are little, you know, vignettes that they send out twice a week, um, just as a way to, to kind of make you stop and think um, about how grateful, you know, it is to be, um, you know, working where we do, but also with a great group of folks, um, you know, pre pandemic and, and hopefully now as things get back to a little bit more sense of, of normal, um, they do movie nights, book clubs, there's walking groups, they organize monthly challenges such as a water challenge, uh, fitness challenges, and some of that stuff actually did continue during the pandemic. So it was was great for them to be able to um, maintain that level of connectedness, um, which you see throughout, you know, our, our entire organization. So to wrap things up, I, 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 I did want to share sort of what I feel has worked for us as, as a team um, and for me as a leader, because I'm always looking for ways to support people, but to get them involved in, in what we're doing so that there's a sense of belongingness. Um, firstly, empower your staff, um, give them the freedom to bring forward ideas, uh, be heard and, and always looking for ways to improve your workplace because uh, the majority of ideas that come don't come from me or our leadership team. They, they come from our employees um, and they're the ones that really um, are the backbone of, of, of you know, our, our organization. Um, you know, it's always it's, it's always useful and um, to remind staff, you know, especially those that are newly hired or on a regular basis that there are available benefits, um, you know, that, that were provided through the institution itself, um, EFAP, counseling services, and, and other benefits, because I sometimes think that we forget about those. Those almost become, yeah, well, that's what someone else looks after, you know, in people and culture, formerly called HR. Um, but I think it is important on a regular basis, um, to, you know, to be mindful of what people are going through and, and to be able to say, hey, that, you know, the help you need is maybe outside of what we're able to provide and and these are available to you as to you as well um but get people involved um and and you've got to have those champions um you know like our wellness group and and others um they're the ones that are making things happen you've got to recognize and celebrate their achievements and i mean individually and as a larger group um i think it's extremely important um but you also have to be open and transparent in your communications. Um, be willing to listen to concerns or just get a basic understanding of, of what's going on in people's lives. If you don't know the answer, say that. Um, people respect honesty. I, I don't always have the answer, um, but I, I usually try to find out, well, I don't usually, I do uh, try to find out if I can find an answer to that question. Um, and sometimes it's it's still nebulous, but it's going that extra step to find out and, and make people feel comfortable that you're there for them. And I, I guess lastly, is to, it's to be kind to each other. Um, when someone wants to chat, it may not always be about work. So take that two or three minutes just to, you know, to listen to what they have to say. Um, I think it'll make them feel a whole lot better, but it also make you feel a whole lot better. Um, and lastly, um, it, it's really get out of their way. Um, you know, let them be their best. Um, I've often said, you know, and, and, and sometimes somebody would say, wow, you know, it's like your wellness committee or other groups. It's like, geez, they've been in a room for two hours. Yep, they have. Um, and great things will come out of that two hours and we'll get it back in spades. And I don't always look, you know, at, at a return on investment at, from that perspective, um, but these are, are the people that are the backbone of, of what we're trying to do. Um, and for me, getting out of their way um, is the best way to, to go about doing that.